Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the SEN seminar this afternoon. Uh, we're just admitting people in from the waiting room now, so we'll just wait uh, just a few more minutes, and then I'll introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Spencer Hayes, and I'm one of the uh, members of the SEN team. Um, I work at um, UCL, and I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Gavin Breslin, uh, who's gonna give us a talk today. He's one of my colleagues. We were just discussing before um, we started that we've um, collaborated together for nearly 20 years now, actually. So that's uh, it's quite a nice uh, reflection. So Gavin is a, a senior lecturer at the Bamford Centre for Mental Health and Wellbeing uh, in the School of Psychology, University of Ulster in the north of Ireland. And his title this afternoon uh, is entitled How Physical Activity in Sport Can Impact Mental Health and Wellbeing Across Educational Settings. I'm looking forward to the talk a lot and I'll let Gavin do a mini introduction uh, for you. And uh, I'm looking forward to the talk, Gavin. So over to you, please. Okay, thanks very much, Spencer. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, and it's, it's great to give a talk on some of the work I've been involved in uh, for uh, quite a while now. Um, I say Spencer and I were, were chatting. It's, it's, we've been, I guess, working together uh, for close to 20 years. And that was based back when we were doing our PhDs, uh, when you were based at Liverpool John Moore's, now it's based at Queen's University. Um, and very interesting, we, we, we were um, doing a lot of work on learning, motor learning in particular, and trying to understand the mechanisms behind how we observe, observe uh, someone doing physical practice, uh, whether that's a, a motor skill um, or decision making, and then uh, trying to get, um, I guess, novel volunteers or learners to try and pick up on that um, and replicate it. So we actually spent quite a lot of our early days, uh, Spencer, in in labs where we had motion capture equipment and we essentially uh, counted down three, two, one, and we got people to kick balls or throw darts or um, uh, do different types of, of movement behaviors. And then we monitored that and we monitored that over days and, and sometimes weeks as well. And we done that with kids and we also done it with, 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 with adults. Um, so yeah, my, my journey after sort of the PhD, uh, it's great to be here, but it, it's the, the journey after the PhD, um, I left academia and went into uh, public health. I worked in the public health agency or a health promotion agency in Northern Ireland at the time. And I'd done a lot of work uh, in and around mental health and attitudes around mental health. So you're talking really in around 2005, um, 2006, 2007, really looking at mental health awareness um, and attitudes towards mental health and stigma back then. Um, and we really got a lot of the work uh, going large scale surveys across uh, Northern Ireland to try and understand what the, the, the population uh, was feeling like when it comes to, to, to help seek. And of course, you get the troubled nature of Northern Ireland as well. Um, uh, and we, we were looking at some aspects of, of that. Um, today, um, what I'll be talking about is, uh, I guess, moving from public health into uh, Ulster University. And uh, I guess my background is as a sport and exercise psychologist. and what I'm really interested in is the role of physical activity, but also on, on mental health and well-being. And we've done quite a lot of interventions across educational settings uh, as well. So what I would li really like you to think about, if you're interested in sport, great. Um, if you're not interested in sport, um, but you may see ways of trying to engage people uh, who are interested in sport in messages around mental health, this, this will be, be useful. It's not by all means that engagement uh, in mental health messages um, can't be done in other ways as well. And we're looking at things like choir, the use of choir and the use of art um, and engaging young people uh, as well. So um, I think sport does present quite a, a nice vehicle uh, for uh, intervention. And also um, there's a, a great opportunity sort of really engage in, in schools uh, with their work uh, as well. Okay, so there's a bit of an overview uh, of the presentation. Uh, Again, I don't know what everyone's backgrounds are, so I thought I'd keep it quite broad uh, in terms of this. 
and, and then go more specific into some of the interviews. So I want to highlight the benefits of how sport and physical activity can enhance mental health. And there is differences between what we define as sport, what we define as physical activity, and indeed what we define as, uh, as uh, exercise as well. So physical activity is any skeletal movement um, that's made by the body. Um, exercise is something that's uh, a bit more um, structured uh, in nature. And um, sport then has the element of those components, but also has the element of competition included as well. So it's, there's been a use of the terms uh, throughout uh, history or sports psychology or, or, or health psychology even uh, between uh, those sort of terms. Physical activity is usually used in the whole area of, of public health. Um, I want to describe some of the physical activity interventions. These are mainly for children in primary schools. So there's quite a few we've done uh, at Ulster University and it's mainly across uh, Ireland, both in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland as well. And then I want to describe uh, and sort of change tack a bit and to really talk about how mental health can be, um, can be a problem sometimes in sport as well. And how perhaps developing athletes to the top end of their um, their, their, their competition or their elite level can sometimes de develop this level of um, machoism um, that they don't feel as if they can seek help or look for support. And there are some risk factors uh, associated with that. And what I want to do there is sort of take you through some of the studies we've been involved in, mainly at universities, um, working with student athletes, and then um, really highlight uh, something I'm, pr I'm particularly proud of, and that, that would be the, the action plan for well-being in Northern Ireland. It's a six-year action plan to try and understand and support well-being uh, in sport in Northern Ireland. Um, and then finally, then, if we have time, hopefully, um, I want to sort of share some of the resources that's been developed by the British Psychological Society. Um, I chair uh, the, the group on COVID-19 uh, as part of the Division of Sport and Exercise Psychology. And we have a number of documents that we've developed. I'm also a member of the Working Differently group. So we've developed a lot of resources for uh, employees and employers as well. So um, there's one slide at the end that I can share in, in terms of that. If you're not familiar with this, I think it's a good starting point. Um, this is a foreword by the chief medical officers. Um, and they've never been so much in, uh, I guess, our screens. I've been on our screens. Uh, than from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we should know who our, our chief medical officers are. But this is a report that was published in September 2019. So not that, that old. And it's really trying to promote uh, the guidelines, physical activity guidelines. And within it, uh, in the foreword, they make the suggestion that if physical activity were a drug, we would refer to it as a miracle cure due to the great many illnesses it can prevent and help treat. So that's not sport, okay? That's Sport is part of it, but it's not sports. Physical activity is this skeletal movement that can bring about uh, some changes. And we know that the evidence for physical health uh, in terms of non-communicable uh, diseases, 16 to 18 even more uh, non-communicable uh, diseases that can be um, helped or prevented uh, as a result of uh, exercise or physical activity. Um, uh, so there, there is this big strong message there. In terms of a psychologist, I'm quite interested in, well, how does physical activity uh, have an influence on things like children's well-being? How does it have an influence on depression, anxiety, and um, perhaps schizophrenia um, as well. So it, we, the, the evidence um, for these type of uh, disorders is perhaps uh, not as strong as it would be for the physical health issues, but for things like depression and stuff, it, it is a bit more um, convincing. And I thought I would share this, and this is how you start to know uh, there is some convincing evidence. Um, so that when you start to see the emergence of consensus statements, so here you can see Rosenbaum and Stubbs um, in terms of uh, the evidence base growing. And on the right hand side of the screen there, hopefully you can see, um, essentially um, there has been organizations, um, yeah, so there's been organizations um, like uh, the American College of Sports Medicine, the British uh, Association of Sport and Exercise Science or BASES, um, and uh, uh, developing these international consensus statements and summarizing uh, the evidence um, for uh, the, both the prevention and for the treatment of, um, uh, of physical activity. If we look at the, the Czech Road et al. study uh, in 2018, that's quite convincing as well, um, because within that there's over a million participants took part in the study. Um, and you can see the benefits again of physical activity for having a positive influence on mental health. 
In terms of treatment, um, you can see for reductions of depression and some psychotic disorders as well. Uh, so the evidence, again, is, is growing. And when we are starting to look, and the, the evidence is most developed in the area of reducing uh, symptoms of depression, and the effects seem to be medium effects or small effects, and you see some of the effect sizes uh, there as well. Um, and some of the rationales that they're, they're making here uh, and for the development of the consensus statement is trying to close the life uh, expectancy gap of uh, some of the people with uh, mental illness. And because one of the things we, we, we know about that is that um, overall levels of physical activity in those with mental illness is a lot, uh, I guess physical activity is a, a lot lower. Um, so we're trying to increase it. Sometimes it's part of uh, the illness. We also know sedentary behavior is higher. Uh, as well. So you can see in Rosenbaum, Biddle, it all's work as well is really focused on uh, sedentary behavior being higher. And we also know that with mental illness, there is the comorbidities. There's three to four times more likely to have uh, other uh, uh, issues going on, illness, uh, whether that's cardiovascular disease or, or others. Um, from a psychological perspective, again, from a, a social psychological perspective, there's relationships, uh, social confidence uh, might uh, be a side uh, effect. Uh, self-esteem or, or quality of life may be uh, influenced by, um, by not being, 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 being. These are some of the studies we've been involved in. Um, so the first one, the left-hand side, we work with a, a commercial weight loss program. Um, and we essentially introduced some physical activity consultations uh, within those programs. And we worked with women um, who were, I guess, at a, at a readiness for change as well. So they were signing up to these programs already. And that's, that's really important. Um, and what we've done is they, they went through the, the uh, augmented uh, or the commercial weight loss program. And we also had another version of it as well, um, where we had physical activity consultations that include one-to-one -one sessions, group sessions, and then goal setting and monitoring of physical activity as well. And within six weeks, it was a very short program that we found there was reductions in anxiety, social dysfunction, and some symptoms of depression. And that was in comparison to a group of women who were going along uh, just to take part to lose weight. Uh, in those, those programs. So there is some uh, merits in, in physical activity, at least in the, the, the short uh, term. And we're looking at numbers of steps increasing in that program, about 5,000 steps, uh, increasing to maybe 9,000 or 10,000 uh, in that program, bringing about some of those changes. Um, we also had a program you can see in the right-hand side where we use financial incentives and we start to work on using implementation and tension prompts. So we're using the theory of planned behavior, a psychological theory that works on attitudes, uh, social norms, and uh, working on confidence as well, uh, to try and build up, um, uh, I guess, uh, people's confidence and their, their views towards physical activity. And we found, again, in a short program, the physical activity increased and there were some positive well-being uh, dimensions to that as well that, that, that came about. Um, quite interesting, probably one of our most recent studies, and this is with colleagues, in uh, the Mental Health Foundation, uh, Jade Yap, and uh, colleagues at Queen's University in Belfast as well. Um, and here we developed a program for those with serious mental illness. And what we found is that the, the program that we thought that would be uh, very effective um, wasn't gonna be probably because of the uptakes, the motivational factors in around taking part in physical activity uh, was the big challenge. So we worked in a co-production uh, process uh, across several months uh, with uh, those with severe uh, mental illness to try and bring about a readiness for change. And then when we did, it was so low intensity type physical activities, engagement, and we started to build up on that and we find some success uh, with it uh, as well. Um, some of our current work, um, and again, I'm trying to tie this in with, with, with schools, um, with colleges, this talk with schools and some of the work with colleges. High Bank Wood uh, is a young detention center um, in uh, Belfast. And it actually went through a name change a number of years back and uh, to call it High Bank Wood College. And, and here's about trying to support uh, young people um, uh, in their, I guess, their health as well. So here we've got a number of mental health awareness type programs and physical exercise uh, or physical activity programs to try and bring about some changes and, and trying to get them engaged in some positive messages around uh, mental health uh, as well. We have a, a, a program that's set up for on the left-hand side here in, on the Shannon Clinic. This is a medium secure unit, um, and that's been held up because of COVID-19. So we have a randomized control trial that we're ready to uh, embark on there. So again, some challenges uh, with uh, how we can uh, rule that out. But again, we're, we're, we're working on a co-production way to try and bring about uh, those changes. Um, 
so we have some benefit. Um, what I want to turn to now, uh, and again, you can see some of the evidence for um, uh, severe mental illness, but I'm quite interested as a sport and exercise psychologist in the role of sport as well. So there is the mechanics of physical activity and the movement behavior that brings about changes in the body. Um, but I'm also interested as well in the engagement with others, the social interactions and the relationships that you have and the conversations you have uh, with your mates, essentially, if you're going to play football. Um, when kids are together, it's more than just the activity itself. So it's the psychosocial bits, the, the developmental uh, uh, parts that go along with sport that sometimes are overlooked. So I thought I'd present some evidence here for some longitudinal studies. Um, some of the work that we've been involved in, we can see there's some positive uh, benefits here in terms of psycho health, psychosocial health benefits. Um, but we can see from the Jude uh, et al. study and also the Doris et al. 2019 longitudinal studies. So four year or five, five year, sorry, follow-up studies um, where they're starting to see reductions in depression for those involved with school sport, um, lower perceived stress, higher self-rated mental health, and that might be a part two uh, linked to some levels of uh, self-regulation as well and what that brings about. And I remember seeing a study uh, that was conducted and uh, went to a visit in Boston where sport uh, was a way uh, of engaging kids at break times and lunch times. And then when they were back in the class, they seemed to be better classroom management uh, as well. Um, also, um, I guess at the bottom of the slide here, you'll see um, some research. And I think this is something uh, we, we should maybe look at and see, can we, we get some uh, further benefits? So sport is associated with small gains and perceptions of social competence. So the perception of being able to have conversations, engage with peers, uh, perhaps engage with uh, parents and uh, teachers and stuff uh, as well. So there's a broad sort of re remit uh, there uh, and benefit again. Um, some of the measures, this is a study that was done with the Public Health Agency uh, a number of years ago now, but the figures are more or less the same in around the, the number of uh, kids in Northern Ireland through self-report are meeting the, the guidelines. So there's less than a quarter of 9 to 11 year olds meet current recommended levels of physical activity. We know that boys are a bit more active uh, than girls. And what I'm quite interested in is not just the physical activity levels, but also how that correlates or links with um, well-being factors or psychosocial health. So the profile here, and again, if this is a cross-sectional study, uh, I mean, I know there's some shortcomings with that, um, but it starts to give us a, a bit of a snapshot that a profile of kids who are meeting the guidelines of physical activity of 60 minutes of more to vigorous uh, activity uh, uh, a day, uh, each day of the week, that they're, they're, um, they have a profile that they feel more satisfied, more comfortable. And again, from a teaching point of view, if you have children with those sort of characteristics, then you can sort of see how that's uh, useful for classroom management or self-regulation. They're also scoring higher in resilience, uh, achievement, uh, global self-esteem, some elements of social acceptance and social support from peers. Now we use some uh, various measures in this between the kids during quality of life measure and a few others uh, as well. If I move forward uh, and look at some of the systematic reviews, there was a review done in 2011 by Biddle and Sarah um, and essentially the, the review uh, suggests that there's potentially beneficial effects for reduced depression, a small beneficial effect for reduced anxiety and improvements in self-esteem. So like with adults, there's some evidence uh, with young kids as well. How convinced you are by that and how convinced I'm by some of that evidence, I still, um, I, I'm still i still searching. Um, we conducted our own systematic review in 2016 and we were really focused on school-based interventions and physical activity. And we find that physical activity on the whole led to increases uh, in well-being, but we also know that there's a critical evaluation bit in around uh, well-being measurements. So there's a huge um, range of measurements is used uh, for uh, looking at well-being or quality of life or psychosocial health. And I think there should be some sort of level of consensus or standardization in around which measures we do use. And of course, what definitions we take of well-being uh, as well. We also know there's variations in intensity and duration of interventions, and of, co of course, the sustainability of, of interventions. So once an intervention is going to school, if it's a 10 week intervention, 12 weeks, um, what, what is the sustainability of that afterwards or what's the legacy uh, of that? So a lot of questions still uh, in the round, but on the whole, physical activity seems to have this uh, positive beneficial uh, effect from the systematic review. If we look at some of the interventions, this is a, a book I wrote back uh, with my co-author Stuart Cottrell and Neil Weston uh, in 2016. Um, 
And within it, um, we looked at not only sport, we looked at exercise and we presented some of our interventions in that as well. A lot of the interventions are in peer review uh, journals. Um, and the interventions range from, so what, what is useful? What can be done? And there, seems, there can be at times barriers of, for, for teachers, uh, essentially. So you're coming in with an intervention. What does it mean for the teacher to deliver it? Um, so we, we, we approach that in a number of different ways. And the first one here, you see in the drummy uh, study. Um, so it's essentially very, very simple five minute physical activity breaks. So stand up behind your chair and do activities. It can be put up on a screen uh, if the teacher didn't want uh, to lead it all the time. But the teacher led these type of exercises. Um, and what we found is an increase in physical activity. We had no uh, well-being measures uh, within that. We did uh, measure some of Harder's uh, self-perception profile, and we see some changes uh, in that. The second study uh, there is the PATCH study. So physical activities to improve uh, children's health. And this was uh, run in Belfast, but we also had some collaboration with Liverpool John Moores in this one as well. And again, we found increases in physical activity and that having a, a, a beneficial effect on some levels of uh, the self-perception profiles as well. Um, Ruth Rafferty was a PhD student a number of years back um, who conducted um, a physical activity intervention. So again, Ruth would have done the systematic review uh, with us. Um, and what Ruth found was physical activity increased psychological well-being in her interventions. And then we started to look then at this uh, role of sedentary behavior as well. So independent of physical activity levels, how much sitting time, um, can, can we interrupt the sitting time to see if that was about, had any beneficial effects? When we actually done that, we actually found that it was very difficult to reduce sedentary behavior time. So in that study, we actually found there was no changes in uh, psychosocial health or psychological well-being. And it might be down to that we weren't able to, that the intervention wasn't strong enough to bring about the changes in reducing sedentary behavior time. We did increase physical activity though uh, in a separate study there that, that, that as I say, had an increase in well-being. We also done some work uh, as well with uh, Ben Fitzpatrick, looking at physical activity program for children with intellectual disability. And again, we found some increases in physical activity here and some beneficial effects, again, on, on psychosocial health. Um, the Healthy Choices program, this is a, a program that um, we developed and we used this uh, or developed this based on uh, self-determination theory. And here we wanted to see the links. We didn't think the link between physical activity and well-being or psychosocial health was as straightforward. So there was a lot of complexity to it. Um, and we felt that there has to be other things going on in the children's life, or there even the perceptions of autonomy, uh, supportive environments uh, as well. And what we find is physical activity increased, but physical activity on its own wasn't a predictor of uh, improved well-being. It seems to be uh, mediated by um, autonomy support. And also if the child's intrinsically motivated as well uh, to be active. So that lay, puts another layer of, um, I guess, psychological theory uh, to trying to understand uh, changes and behavior change in around physical activity and, and the benefits for that. Probably one of the studies I'm very proud of um, uh, is the Sport for Life program. So this is a program started in 2009. This is the biggest uh, physical activity and healthy lifestyle program in Northern Ireland at the time. There's 3,000 kids involved in it. Um, it was then extended uh, in 2013, 2012, 2013, and we went across the whole island of Ireland and there's 7,000 kids uh, included in it. And we had a subsample for the, for the research. Um, and essentially that program included physical activity in terms of exercises um, in around uh, healthy body and healthy mind. We had also a lot of exercise in around understanding uh, the influence of uh, nutrition uh, and the benefits of nutrition. And we also had uh, uh, some sessions with the kids, essentially looking at um, the working in teams and working with each other uh, on that. So that, that was a program that uh, was running across all, all of uh, the North of Ireland and, and the South of Ireland. And there's a legacy to that as well, uh, in terms of going into uh, teaching, uh, uh, I guess, uh, stu students who were in uh, pre-training -tra uh, for teaching or teacher training courses, and we're going to deliver the intervention with them as well, so they could uh, include it in, in their interventions. Um, here's some of the studies that have been used uh, for, for that. You can sort of see the psychosocial health. Uh, and a lot of the studies that we've really focused on is on children of low socioeconomic uh, status. Here's some studies that we can uh, share with you. 
I'm homeschooling at the minute, so I have a question from my daughter. Hold on, give me a second, guys. That's all right. Yes, could you? That would be great. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so we have some interventions that showed some benefits. Um, I'm going to change tack here a bit uh, in terms of uh, the role of sport uh, in uh, influencing uh, mental health uh, as well. And I do think there's a, a huge power in sport uh, to try and engage uh, our communities. So um, sport and mental health says the picture is that physical activity is very uh, positive and beneficial uh, for health. Sport has also got a lot of its, its benefits, but there are also some uh, downsides to it as well. Um, so for example, uh, we know that um, at the other end of sport, the elite side of sport, um, that we know that there's, there's some challenges and we know that some environments in sport uh, can cause some problems as well in terms of poor mental health. That could be transition in sport, it could be injury uh, due to sport, um, or it could be essentially as for young people not being selected or um, being supported, uh, what they see to be supported by uh, the people around in terms of their coaches. So the environment is very much uh, important uh, in that. We've done some work um, on sport and mental health uh, at universities. This is, a, I guess, a summary of some of the, the research. And we were quite interested. We've done a, a chapter with Brad Donahue based in Nevada University. Uh, in America and uh, Shane Murphy as well. And we're really interested to see, well, what's the view is, if involved in sport and elite side of sport, are you more likely to have a mental health issue? And we, we found that it's not the case. So those in elite sport are as likely as others in the general population to have uh, mental illness or uh, mental health issues. However, under certain circumstances, what we find is that uh, some uh, people uh, were. So here's some of the the studies that we tried to, to summarize. So here you can start to see some high levels of anxiety, um, eating disorders perhaps, um, psychological distress. Um, interesting one, recent one uh, in, in Ireland, and again, there's a, another uh, study uh, by Lost et al. looking at this as well, is professional jockeys and the levels of depression. Um, we have a study that's just been uh, completed um, and it's just been accepted for publication, uh, and that's an equestrian sport as well. So symptoms of depression uh, are, are just slightly higher than the, the, the general population. We also find that um, the, if we look at athletes or student athletes, and Shannon et al. Uh, done a study and see that, that there's higher mean scores of stress in student athletes um, compared to uh, non-athletes, so it's a student population, and that's an American sample. If we look at the UK, um, in terms of those scoring low in well-being, 35% um, of a sample of student athletes were scoring low well-being compared to the UK uh, population uh, scoring 15%. So again, there's, there's some differences there. Um, and also, if that's influenced or can be influenced by concussion, which can be at high rates of concussion depending on the sport again. So 2.4 two times more likely to experience depression if you um, had uh, concussion. We conducted a systematic review uh, on how we could try and implement some change in the round sport and the culture of sport uh, at universities, but also in, in community sport as well. And we started to look at what, what mental health awareness interventions were out there. And we got a lot of hits on the, on the review, but when we actually got down into our criteria, it was very stringent criteria on looking at the benefits pre post testing, maybe randomized control trials, um, our numbers were really reduced um, and we found there's only uh, around 10 studies uh, that really outlined uh, the, I guess, uh, had good, good quality uh, interventions for mental health awareness. Now, we did uh, repeat that uh, systematic reviews actually submitted this morning and there's 28 studies. So this is a, an area that's grown very quickly. So that was done in 2017 uh, and there's 28 studies now with good quality type of interventions trying to have an influence on mental health uh, in, in athletes. It's also around the time as well where there's a number of consensus statements that has been brought out by a lot of the organizations who promote sport. This triggered, uh, I guess, a, a reflection on my part and the, the, the team's part as well in terms of the, the role of sport again and, and how we could ensure that mental health awareness programs uh, in sport uh, could be as effective as possible for athletes, coaches, and then broadened out to parents and, and stuff and officials as well. 
Um, so we wrote a, a book. This was edited by uh, myself and Jerry Levy. And we had quite a number of uh, uh, interventions that, that, that came through uh, that we reported on. And there's two sections to this, one of which the power of sport within sport to try and support uh, athletes, but also, I guess, section two was really looking at mental health awareness programs for the public. So what can we use and how can we engage or use sport as an engagement tool or the hook to try and engage young men, for example, uh, or young women into uh, talking about mental health uh, issues or, or, or problems. So here are some of the, the, the studies uh, that were included in the book. Um, so the State of Mind Ireland program, and there's also a State of Mind program in the UK as, as well. Um, and this was a, a mental health awareness program, brought by big change, it's very much involved in this, this program where we increase mental health awareness, um, self-management, um, some elements of us included some mindfulness training and stuff as well. And we delivered that to uh, many students uh, within Ulster University, both in sport and in schools of psychology uh, and business engineering. And we also delivered it in University College Cork uh, as well. So we found some real positive benefits and changes uh, in the State of Mind Ireland program. We also had the Mood Matters uh, uh, pilot program as well on the top left hand side. And again, we started to see some things that changes in knowledge and understanding, more knowledge about mental health disorders uh, as a result of taking part uh, in the programs. The State of Mind program was around 90 minutes. Uh, the Mood Matters program was around the same in terms of, of, of length of time. Um, so again, based at, at, at universities, uh, many of those. The TOPS program, and this was led by Brad Donahue again in Nevada uh, University, uh, or University of Nevada. And this is a program, again, directed firstly towards uh, student athletes, and it was delivered by himself and a number of trained personnel uh, as well in the Royal Mental Health Awareness who, with, who understand the culture of sport. And then that has been broadened out beyond um, uh, athletes uh, to, to others in uh, the university and in the, the, the community as well. There's other programs like the Head of the Game program in uh, Australia, again, having uh, huge impacts in mental health awareness, and that's led by Christian Swan and uh, Bella and colleagues. And Martin Turner as well uh, delivered on the rational motive um, behavioral therapy. So more intense type of one-to-one -one sort of support uh, with athletes that then can be broadened out uh, as well. The second section of the book, and again, I've sort of tried to highlight some of the, the programs. Here you can see some similarities uh, from the State of Mind uh, Ireland program. The, the State of Mind program in the UK, again, raising mental health awareness, um, but we were involved in, in that program and we delivered that in prisons and in uh, college settings as well. Um, so there's within that section of the book, there's a number of, uh, I guess, evidence-based programs showing you uh, essentially some, some changes. And um, it's another program uh, as well, um, Tackling the Blues, uh, led by H. Hill University. Um, and that has had a huge uh, impact across the community as well, again, of engaging uh, mainly uh, men in that program. And they've also got uh, another part of the program that goes into schools uh, as well. So here's some of the, the factors, and I guess us delivering some of the programs at Ulster University. Um, and we've seen some changes and at uh, University College Cork as well. This is a state of mind program where we start to see mental health awareness increasing, uh, resilience uh, levels uh, increasing, reductions in stress and understanding of life, life challenges as well. Um, knowledge of psychological disorders, self-management of mental health, uh, willingness to support others, um, mindfulness exercises. So this is, and I put an asterisk beside this one because there's, there's a couple of different versions of the state of mind Ireland program um, where we try to work on it by increasing the sort of the, the, the content where it goes beyond a 90 minute session to uh, engage in on an app or actually coming back to the tutors for more advice uh, or support. Um, where we're at with that program, we've just um, uh, published uh, two papers on the, the theory behind uh, the, the development of the intervention itself. So the program content is based on the theory of planned behavior and self-determination theory. Um, and we're making some predictions in the round, the content of the program, and then some of these things that, that, that do change and trying to understand the environments and then autonomy support uh, again. Okay, here, here's also some uh, of the studies. Uh, and I know I'm sort of giving you a whistle tour of these, um, but here's some of the, the studies that we've published. Um, 
that again go into a bit more detail uh, in around the the contents of them um, and I guess some of the research designs as well. Okay, I talked about the Sport for Life program and the Sport for Life program in primary school has probably been something a program is really proud of. This is probably the, the the piece of work that I'm most proud of so far in my career, um, and this has. Uh, been something that was started in 2015. Uh, this is when Sport Northern Ireland uh, came to the university and asked for some advice in the round. There's certain things happening in sports clubs, um, or perhaps there's a, a critical incident uh, occurred in around suicide, or there was um, an incident in around a, a, a person involved in the club uh, who was depressed and wanted to talk to someone, and there was a feeling that there was no uh, support. And what I realized uh, as well is uh, across Northern Ireland, there seemed to be this sort of stop-start reaction. So if something did happen in a sports club, you would find if there's some media attention to it, then something would be put in place. Uh, and then there's no consistency across the board uh, or across the country. So I sort of took it on myself to sort of think, right, this is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and there's uh, another gentleman as well, Paul Donnelly, um, who has uh, recently joined Ulster University, uh, but was based in Sport Northern Ireland, had a very similar view. Uh, as well. So we need something, we need a strategy or an action plan, something that's consistent and something that is, has longevity uh, for supporting our communities in, in sport. So that can be in uh, the sport environment uh, or in our communities, but also um, things that could perhaps uh, be going into schools and stuff as well. Um, so what was supposed to be a six month project probably turned into three to four uh, years uh, of work, uh, including systematic reviews, um, cross-sectional studies, the design of interventions. Now, this is at a time when there wasn't any work done. And if anybody's familiar with this area, you'll see that the International Olympic Committee, um, the uh, BASES, the British Association for Sport and Exercise uh, Sciences, um, and a number of other large organizations and even governments um, have put in place um, sort of uh, interventions or action plans. So at the very start, there was very little evidence base for this. So we started to generate it ourselves. And we had this working group uh, come together to develop this uh, plan. So as with any evidence-based uh, type of, you would expect in a policy or action plan or strategy um, that you need to really stick to what, what works. So what is there in the community? And we didn't find there was much. So we've done a lot of work uh, looking at what interventions and stuff uh, work. So it's taken us up to around 2018 to 2019 to really put in place uh, this program that, or this uh, action plan that is going out across, uh, has gone out across Northern Ireland in terms of um, being supported by, by government. Um, its aim is to achieve uh, a number of, of key outcomes, that is to engage, promote and support uh, those involved in the sports clubs and uh, their coaches and officials, um, and also to try and build capacity and capability. That's across all government departments uh, as well. So this isn't something that's just led by Sport Northern Ireland or the Public Health Agency. They're looking for input from across the different department, uh, the departments as well. Also looking to identify and inspire. So this is where sport is, has the power again of looking at Olympic athletes from Northern Ireland and um, uh, athletes who are high level in football um, or hockey, whatever it might be, both males and females, who can actually uh, champion uh, some of the, the outputs or the actions from this. So there's 15 actions and 29 outputs from uh, the, the, the plan. And of course, invest and implement. We can't do this without uh, investment or resource. And so far, the, the, the action plan has been resourced. So this is something that is ongoing um, and there's a, a pilot evaluation that seems very positive uh, in terms of the first year. Second year, and um, there's some uh, evaluation during COVID, a lot of the, the information went online in terms of program uh, delivery uh, as well. And um, there will be a, 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 an evaluation component as we, as we go along after the six years. Uh, this is the team uh, of people who uh, put it together. So it's made up of charitable organizations, different departments, um, and academia as well, Ulster University, and of course, uh, some of the, the champions in sport like Paddy Barnes and stuff who's been involved in sport uh, development. Um, and this isn't too far away from my home when you know you're doing something right uh, in terms of interventions or evidence-based practice when they blow your report up um, and they put it on the side of a, a, a building. Um, and when you drive past it, you sort of give a nod that there is a commitment uh, to wellbeing sport that isn't start stop uh, reaction to it. It's something broader than that. And there's a huge amount of impact in the community uh, as, as a result. Um, this then fostered on some further work um, where 
there's people from 10 different countries uh, involved in, in this. Um, where we've done a systematic review, as you can see, and we've updated it on what interventions work for mental health awareness and self, uh, self management. And what we realized is there's quite variation uh, in reporting. So we thought very early on, as this wave has, has come along in terms of a lot of people interested, a lot of increase in the, the amount of research in this area of mental health and sport, that we put a consensus statement uh, together. So this was across, again, it took about two years to do this, um, where we had a number of meetings of um, experts and we came up with six recommendations. Um, uh, from a, one of which is the definitions of mental health within any intervention to identify standards of data collection and analysis um, to look at the different measures that's used to look at different um, pathologies perhaps um, uh, or mediating factors and uh, that's involved recommendation three there's a selection of appropriate theories and models so look at different guidelines or theories and models for behavior change again relying on some psychology um, or biopsychosocial approaches, or some of the theories I've already mentioned uh, included there. Um, looking at minimal competencies for mental health awareness training. Um, so uh, a recent advert went out by Sport Northern Ireland looking for trainers, um, and there's a, a minimum requirement linked in with the public health agency in terms of what their requirements are for trainers as well. So this area has moved on uh, in terms of making sure that we have adequate quality in place uh, as well as uh, the research as well uh, and the programs. Um, to provide evidence-based uh, guidance for the selection of mental health awareness implementation programs. So it's also um, something that is um, sensitive to age, gender, culture, uh, which is quality assured. And also to identify what role administrators, parents, uh, and a lot of others can have in mental health promotion within sports clubs. And it's actually quite reassuring to hear, especially when you get contacted by a lot of uh, clubs across Northern Ireland and further afield about looking for some of these resources that they can use uh, as well. So there is quite a lot of work uh, that has been done there, but all, all for the, the betterment. Um, and again, we're, we're evaluating as, as we go through. Um, finally, um, I want to just keep an eye on time. I want to um, sort of conclude with some of the work that has been done by the British Psychological Society. So I mentioned at the start that there is a Division of Sport and Exercise Psychology uh, group uh, for, in response to COVID-19. This was a group assembled back in March uh, last year. And we developed uh, essentially two documents on the left-hand side there for support youth athletes during COVID-19 and advice for athletes during COVID-19 as well. Um, and that's again, evidence-based uh, practice. We used a lot of the systematic reviews, the consensus statements in the development of this. And of course we used a lot of others uh, research as well uh, in the area of mental health uh, awareness. We also use a lot of psychological skills uh, training we know in sports psychology, like mental imagery, self-talk, um, uh, personal management uh, and lifestyle skills as well uh, to try and give some help uh, to coaches and to athletes and their parents. So that might be of use to, to some of you or if you want to, to share it. Um, I'm also part of a, a, another group in the BPS, which is the, the Working Differently group. And we use a lot of evidence as a group of uh, health, health psychologists, sport and exercise psychologists, occupational psychologists, clinical psychologists, counseling psychologists, and can go on and on, educational psychologists. Um, and they come together to try and provide some advice uh, again, evidence-based advice in around how you tr can try and support young people um, maybe go through transition of lockdown uh, and what sort of training and stuff um, they, they could do um, and what sort of support uh, is available for them. And we developed some resources for employers uh, as well. So our work uh, is quite broad uh, within uh, sport and exercise psychology. And um, it's, I guess, moved uh, within sport, um, within education, and it's also gone into prisons uh, as well, and it's gone into uh, workplaces as well. So quite a, a bit of a broad, uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, spread, but hopefully impact as well, hopefully it's having a, a difference uh, as well. Okay, let's just take this opportunity to thank you for listening and um, I'll hand it back over uh, to Spencer. Yeah, thank you so much, Gavin. That was uh, uh, super interesting. Uh, if you, you've stopped sharing your screen, have you now? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone feels comfortable to pop their videos on if they want to, or their um, 
audio devices, that's that's fine. I can open the floor to any questions before um, I ask a couple of questions. So um, you can use your use your mechanism, which is raising your hand. Um, uh, I'll just quickly monitor the chat, Gavin. Um, a question here uh, from Paul Winter: What are the mental health benefits of singing? Um, of sing it says singing as opposed to other physical activities. So um, it says singing. So I'm not quite sure what that means. But what what are the mental health benefits of? Um, uh, yeah, I think I know what that relates you know to. What that means? Okay. I, might, I might be wrong. Um, so some, some of the work that we're involved in uh, now is looking at the engagement using football with uh, young young kids. Um, and we're also looking with, well, we're working with kids in care as well. So okay. the, the social workers, the, the clinical psychologists uh, have been using uh, football as a way on a Thursday afternoon to try and engage uh, young, young people. Um, and they're finding that, that it's, it's quite useful uh, for having for opening a conversation uh, about some uh, issues that, that might be going on in, in their lives and developing that relationship further. And um, yeah. one strand of that project and the strand is uh, choir practice. We know it's sport um, isn't for everybody. Um, so we know that as, in terms of a, a trying to engage it, we know that art works quite well. Um, and we know the choir practice uh, uh, works quite, quite well as well. So there's another group of uh, social workers um, who are using choir as, as an engagement tool. They haven't been using it during COVID for reasons of social distancing and, and I guess the, the, the guidelines, but um, they have used it quite a bit to, to try and, and engage young people. And I think it does link to this whole area of self-regulation. Um, self-regulation first, developing relationships, and then perhaps as a clinical psychologist, social worker, be able to talk about the higher order uh, processes um, or mental health issues or concern or even deeply trauma that may be uh, have, a, have an effect. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's, it's very clear, Gavin, across your 45-minute um, talk there that you, you've done um, lots of work in, in your career, which is um, amazing, actually. And one of the things that, that struck me is that you've worked from kind of um, strategy, policy, consensus statements, down to different types of interventions. And one thing that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk then was intervention efficacy in schools. Do you have any tips then in terms of um, the effectiveness um, of those types of intervention buying from schools and also therefore that what might facilitate legacy of those interventions? Yeah, we, we learned so much from the Sport for Life programme. The Sport for Life programme was the, the, the programme, so it was a multi-component uh, health programme um, that mainly focused on physical activity and then we're expecting the benefits to come, come from that. And it was successful when we, and we've done a randomised control trial with it uh, in Northern Ireland. We upscaled it um, because it was successful and it was actually endorsed by the, the World Health Organisation as well because it was with a group of socially economic disadvantaged kids. Um, and when we upscaled it, um, we found then that the comparison to the control group, um, that physical activity increased. And then uh, at post-intervention, it, it didn't. Uh, there was no real differences. And to us, and as a researcher, when you see that um, after coming off the back of a really large scale program, and if anybody is involved in these physical activity programs, when you're going out to maybe 40 or 50 schools, uh, you're engaging two classrooms in each school. Um, and you need a huge team. It's very labor intensive um, planning uh, and stuff as well. Um, and you need a lot of buy-in uh, from, from the schools. So we feel that some of the messages uh, in and around that, and I think there, there is something, um, not for all schools, and I think it's the ethos of the school as well. Um, there's something in the room whether they buy into the program and whether the teacher buys into the program as well. So if the teacher's involved in the delivery of the program, that's, that's great. Um, but if the teacher feels that, especially in primary schools, if they feel that this is a, a chance for them to maybe not be involved in or let um, one of our uh, students who would go and deliver the programme, uh, they're supposed to co-deliver it, but they find that sometimes some of the teachers would step back and say, you know, you go ahead, you, you know more about it, you're more comfortable with it. Um, yeah. And yeah, that, that seemed to be uh, one of the, the issues. Or when you're going in to deliver an intervention on physical activity, if it's seen as something that we'll do that instead of PE this week, it can't be seen as physical education. It has to be something in addition to it. So you can sort of see why from an experimental point of view that if we go into uh, schools and some 
kept it as a physical activity program and some use it as a compensation for physical education, then we wouldn't find a difference in our control. So the, for the starting point, and we, we actually wrote an article, one of the articles I shared with you, we go into detail about advice for people developing these type of programs, especially PhD uh, students and stuff going embarking on some of this work and engaging with schools. Um, they have a lot going on uh, in, in terms of schools and a lot of, they have a lot that teachers have a lot to do uh, in the day. So it's trying to see how it fits in with their curriculum and how it's essentially is congruent with the school. Um, yeah. Get that then. And we have some really, really great schools uh, in, in Belfast area where we work and we pilot a lot of our work and stuff as well. Um, and some of the teachers are just, they're just looking for us to come in, try new things out and they're, they're very keen. And it might be because they have an interest themselves in sport or exercise or physical activity. Yeah, I guess it would be interesting to see now what happens um, post a pandemic, you know, and well-being, physical well-being and mental well-being is obviously um it's in it's in all of the press and all of the, all, all of the kind of broadsheets and stuff like that so that'd be quite interesting well, well I, I have a comment just about that in terms of some of the physical activity levels um and there's quite a, a number of studies um look to see if children's physical activity has gone down as a result of covid um and i think it's a, if, if we sort of ask it in a way where's the opportunities for kids around physical activity decreased and you could actually say in the morning when you get up um it's a transport to school if kids walk to school that's gone um, if it's um, playtime, uh, that's gone in, in school uh, settings. Uh, there's the physical education, uh, although we might get some stuff sent online um, or teachers are sending that out. Um, you can sort of see how that, that, that's a, an opportunity that's missed. Um, playtime with their friends because there's reductions in social interactions. Um, so I, I think as parents, uh, and again, I'm a parent of two uh, daughters, eight and six, um, who yeah, you have to be creative about how you're trying to build in those activities and maybe walking during the day or come up with activities, um, whether that's for them to go out and search for stuff around the, the, the garden or yep. code breaking and stuff. Um, some things we've come up with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think we, we really have to keep an eye on that coming out of uh, lockdowns. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question from Gabriella in the chat, Gavin, was uh, did you include early years in the programme, your Sport for Life programme? No, we didn't have early uh, years in it, but we have uh, another program uh, that we were uh, going to, uh, it was the teachers delivering it, and it was a fundamental movement skills program. And I didn't mention any of that, so we've done some work in that um, in uh, very, very young kids, um, where we're trying to develop uh, agility, coordination, balance, uh, and, and, and speed and stuff as well. Um, so yeah, it's not sport um, at all, it's more yeah. about fundamentals of, of movement. Um, it's also been linked sometimes, uh, well, it has been linked um, to physical literacy. And we've written about physical literacy, go back to maybe 2008, 2009. And we've done some studies on physical literacy and definitions of physical literacy. And I can remember being um, commissioned to do a report to try and define physical literacy and then measure it. Um, I think even now there's struggle to do that. Um, and I think the there's a lot of work in, in Canada uh, in terms of the development of definitions and how it isn't just the movement skills, it's also competence-based perceptions and attitudes and, and stuff as well. Um, and we sort of approach that through the harder skills uh, as a psychologist through the sort of competency motivation type approaches. And then we looked at, at movement behavior itself. So we have done some work, happy to share it. If, if um, a person wants to email me, um, I'm happy to share some of that, that, that writing. Yeah, that would be that would be great. I'll, I'll just pose one more question before we uh, we wrap up for the day. You, you mentioned um, oh, it's, it's clearly a very uh, complicated area and and one that has um, multifactorial processes that interact to the efficacy of of physical activity. And I think um, the physical well being aspects are relatively clear. But you touched on, you know, I think you used the term that you, you're not convinced completely on the the, the relationship between physical activity and certain aspects of mental health and you touched on anxiety and depression you know do you think moving forward then that there is scope to look at physical activity and and certain aspects of mental health and maybe even attainment in in schools yeah i think that that comment really comes from um again evidence based from our review and we find that the the, the different measurement tools that were used made it very difficult to be able to stand over 100% uh, 
that physical activity increases this or that uh, in, in children. I think the evidence is stronger in adults. Um, however, um, we also started to measure it's the Healthy Choices Program and uh, Stephen Shannon, who's a colleague of mine, is a PhD student of mine in the past. Um, we started to really look at, I guess, Joan Duda's work um, on motivation and the whole role of the environment and autonomy support. So th there could well be the link between physical activity and, and well-being in kids, um, but we feel uh, that it could be moderated and it could be moderated by um, the, the role of supportive environments as well. Yeah. Of course, what you might find, I think this argument is, is, can be put in around um, screen time is, is negative on well-being. Um, well, if you turn that around and you actually find that if you actually start to assess well-being and kids actually enjoy being on screens, well, their well-being is going to increase. It's their perception of what it is. Overall, their, their health may decrease. So it is, it is very complex uh, in terms of being able to break down uh, predicting uh, factors uh, in, in around that. And I think your second point, there's a second point to that, is that in schools or? It, it was whether or not, it, it, obviously within um, schools now, there's, there's, a, there's a discussion regarding attainment and achievement levels. Obviously now because um, children have been in lockdown and, and they've been away from formal types of teaching, you know, you know, is well-being and mental health and physical well-being related to attainment and achievement? Or could it be? Well, I think it could be. And it has to be in around this whole rule of self-regulation again and mood uh, as well. So we can see that physical in short bouts. Um, and we actually we've done a yeah, it wasn't with kids, but we done we looked at running um, and we've seen that short bouts of running improve mood. Um, so I'm convinced that there there is uh, mood enhancers from uh, taking part in physical activity, exercise, and sport. Um, I also think that we need to look at in that a bit more detail to see how is is there a moderating effect of the self-regulation that then leads to a change in um, academic performance because the child is more ready to sit and go through and be in, in a position to learn better. Um, so I, I think there's, there's an interaction there between I think the, the physiology, the physical movement, what that does to the brain. And then, of course, then this whole social interaction uh, piece as well. Yeah. And I don't think we can ever really take that. I've struggled to sort of take those those apart uh, yeah. and, and be able to be 100% by saying one leads to the other. Or yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And then um, I know that in your early days of PhD, you uh, quantified human movement in terms of time. And we've got one minute to go. So thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I really do appreciate it. And um, we will obviously catch up on a professional level, but I just wanted to, to conclude by saying um, your your work over the last 10 to 15 years is very, very impressive. So um, thank you so much for your time, Gavin. A pleasure, Spencer. Always a pleasure. Okay, thanks. I'm going to stop the recording now and thank you very much for your attendance today, guys, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>